imagine the consequences when you combine dead data with a dead delivery. You have a massive bromide of frightening winter surf Hawaiian North Shore proportions thundering down to bludgeon unsuspecting audiences into stupefaction. I was one of the bludgeoned in that audience that day, and it was dreadful. Are these people really elite? I was left thinking. Welcome back to this weekly edition every Tuesday of the Cutting Edge Japan Business Show. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, President of Dale Cunningy Training Japan. We are filming in the Mochizuki Room today in the Dale Carnegie Japan High Performance Center. We're located in Minato-ku, where all the business action is in Tokyo. Well, where is this cutting edge? For all of us, the quality of our people is the cutting edge for success in Japan. In this show, I will stimulate your thinking about ramping up your business, bring you insights from the best training organization on the planet, provide you with the highest quality Japan information, motivate you to motivate yourself and motivate those around you, help you to shoot the lights out at results time. I don't want to just help you succeed in your business. I want you to dominate. Before we get into this week's topic, here is what caught my attention lately. Dentsu, the advertising giant, has announced it will trim its working hours by 20% from a high of 2,052 hours per year in 2014, or 44 hours a week, assuming a 50 work week a year, Dentsu is aiming for 1,800 hours per employee annually or 36 hours a week by March 2020. We'll also ban working between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. This was in response to the suicide of Matsuri Takahashi, age 24, who jumped to her death from her dormitory on Christmas Day 2015 because she was depressed from all the illegal overtime work hours she was made to put in. The suicide was determined to be a case of karoshi, or death from overwork. She was putting in 100 hours per month in illegal overtime. Prosecutors said there were 1,400 other Dentsu employees also working above the overtime limit. Dentsu President Toshihiro Yamamoto appeared in court for Dentsu's trial over suspected labour violations. They were fined 500,000 yen, or around about $4,500. Has justice been served? What do you think? This is episode number 10, and we are talking about Japanese elites who can't cut it. Sore de wa ikimashou. Let's get going. Society approves titles and status, especially in Japan. We rise through the ranks, and following the Peter Principle, we peak at our upper level of incompetence. On the way up, we pick up titles and accrue status, respect and credence, amplified through the power of our title. Our personal power, though, could be suddenly exposed as bogus when we get up to open our mouths in public. This is one of those the emperor has no clothes moments when all is revealed and we are found severely wanting. I was at a function recently and one of the bureaucratic elite in Japan was there to give a keynote presentation. You generally get to become an elite official in Japan because you went to the right elementary school, middle school, high school, and then the most elite of the universities. The reason these were the right schools up until university is because they have the absolute best system in place to help you become a legend in memorization, rote learning, and test taking. 
At university, you take a couple of years off before you start cramming for the national selection exam, where again, memory and exam technique are the most rewarded skills. You join a ministry and work like a dog for a squillion hours every day for years, simultaneously looking for a powerful patron who you can pledge your allegiance to, your total loyalty. After decades of glacial progress, you emerge a grey-haired elite official, now part of the bureaucratic upper crust. You're often called upon to represent your organisation and speak in public. This is when the whole edifice comes crashing down. This was the case with this official, sent out into the firing line to promulgate the new way forward for his political masters to impress everyone with the potency of their new policies, to win adherence to the path forward. The result? Total fizzer. Why? Because he spoke without energy or passion. He showed us nothing to indicate he felt at all impressed with the importance of his own recommendations. He looked down at his papers the whole time and hardly glanced at the audience. The opportunity to make eye contact, to combine words with the power of his face and to use variations available to his voice through speed and power were in total absence. He was a truly dull correspondent and we were completely dulled to his message. There were no converts to the cause that day. He could return to his desk and tick the box though. The task was completed. Total failure, but completed. Astonishingly, during the post-speech Q&A session, I noticed he perked up like a man really engaged. Sadly, it was only sustained for 30 seconds, but it showed he could do it. I was wondering, why didn't he energise the audience while he commanded the stage? He could actually do it. We all saw that he had the capability and the capacity. I believe he didn't do it because he had no concept and no appreciation for the immense power at his beck and call. His self-concept seemed to be that he was just a grey bureaucrat whose job was to be grey and boring. Obviously, he had received no training or preparation for his task. So his brilliant university pedigree meant little when he was publicly outed at the podium. He was a total failure as a communicator. He became a message killer, a brand assassin instead. He took the whole program backwards, not forwards. Was he an exception, a one-off, the runt of the litter among the bureaucratic ranks of the gifted, great and plausible public speakers? I would love to report that he was an outlier, an exception, a bad apple. No, nope, can't do that. He was typical of that bevy of elite officials who are mainly all acquired status and have almost no personal power projection whatsoever. Let me be fair and point out that Japan is not the only place where the elite run out of gas and are left stranded by the side of the road of bureaucratic progress. Another vaunted profession is that of the elite government official who works in the foreign service of their country. This was a bad week for me. I suffered more of the same elite incompetence, this time from an ambassador. He was a lovely guy, but hopeless as a representative of his nation. You would think that given the high profile nature of their job, they would be experts in promoting their countries. Nope. This was another national reputation suicide effort. Monotone, weak voice, sputtering forth ums and ahs of plenty, with no engagement with the country's fans here in Japan. A voice that sounded so weary and very weary, with the last three or four words in every sentence just slowly petered out. The energy and tone of his voice just subsided, guaranteeing the key message was a total downer, regardless of the actual content of the words. When what we say is not congruent with how we say it, 
we lose 93% of the message. The audience gets distracted by how we look and how we sound. What we are saying is just not registering. Was this a one-off, just the Ambo having a bad day? Find out when we come back from the break. If you want to become a fully competent and confident presenter, then do the High Impact Presentations course. We are all being judged when we speak, be it in the internal team meeting or in a public environment, be it the big bosses, clients, or an industry audience. Everyone is evaluating us. Don't blow it. Get the best training on the planet. Do the High Impact Presentations course now in either Japanese or English. Welcome back. Actually, no, it wasn't the Ambo's rare bad day. I've seen this gentleman in action on many occasions, and this is a case with a scary consistency to his public speaking murder of his country's brand. He is not unusual. In my 31 years of survey here, I've found that most ambassadors are hopeless public speakers. Yes, yes, there are some exceptions, but they just prove the rule. If you doubt what I say, then please send me a list of more than 10 ambassadors here you know who are any good. Do these career diplomats get proper training in the art of public speaking? Astoundingly, no, they don't. They become elite government officials due to their ability to write cables and reports, which usually almost no one reads, by the way. They have large analytical abilities and very big brains. They can really shine in small meetings where they can one-up their rivals and be the smartest intellect in the room. So they get promoted and then get propelled to the front of the stage, handed the microphone, and away they go into ineptitude, writ large under lights in front of the assembled masses. The good thing is that all of their colleagues are equally hopeless, so it seems normal for them. The fundamental error is they simply don't value having a skilled public presentation facility. They miss the opportunity to establish a powerful, positive image of their country. The worst public speaking experience of my diplomatic career was giving a speech on behalf of one of our ambassadors. I was our man in Osaka and had to deliver the speech on behalf of the ambassador because he couldn't make it. The talk was in Japanese, which was no issue as I had given around 400 public speeches in Japanese by that time. The content, however, was challenging. There are four main types of speeches, to inform, to persuade, to entertain and to impress. Foreign ministries around the world tend to love the data dump in form variety. This automatically leads to lots of dull information being imparted to the punters. Why they don't go for the persuade type is a bit of a mystery to me. And all countries seem to make the same inform rather than persuade selection. I absolutely gave it my best shot to liven it up while sticking religiously to the approved ambassadorial text. But what torture it was. Imagine when you combine dead data with a dead delivery, you have a massive bromide of frightening winter surf Hawaiian North Shore proportions thundering down to bludgeon unsuspecting audiences into stupefaction. This is what we usually get from elite government officials. It doesn't have to be like that. There are some bright spots of hope, though, even in Japan. Previous ambassador, Motohiko Nishimura, who I met in Osaka in the mid-1990s during his posting to the Kansai. Yes, Kansai is considered a foreign country by Tokyo, so they have sent an ambassador down there. He was skilled and excellent. English or Japanese, it did not matter. He was the consummate diplomat in the sense he could use his speaking power to capture an audience and have them love Japan. He finished his career as an ambassador to Portugal 
I am sure he was a tremendous asset for his country in creating support for Japan there. Hello to all you elite officials and aspirants out there. Stop boring us all to death, get some proper training and represent your ministries with aplomb. Boys and girls, be ambitious. No, be persuasive. Keep pushing hard with us here at the Cutting Edge Japan Business Show. Subscribe on YouTube. Share it with your family, friends and colleagues. Become a regular. Thank you for watching and remember to hit the subscribe button. Our website details are on screen now, japan.dalecarnegie.com. It is awesome value, so check it out. In episode 11, we are talking about salespeople don't care. Uh, your salespeople communicating the right messages to the buyers? Are you sure they have the right sales philosophy? What do you need to look for to tell? Find out the answers to all of these questions and much, much more next week. So, yoroshiku onegai itashimasu. Please join me for the next episode of the Cutting Edge Japan Business Show. Until then, create serious, massive level of success. We are here to help you do that. Dale Carnegie Training Japan has only one direction in mind for you and your business, and that is up.